During this edition of Behind the Headlines, the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy is proud to offer a special presentation of Rediscovering Pennsylvania History Making. The recent Academy Award-winning movie, Lincoln, may have been intended to bring a fresh look at our 16th president, but what it also did was raise the awareness of one of Lincoln's chief allies in the struggle to end slavery, the congressman played by actor Tommy Lee Jones, a legislator named Thaddeus Stevens. Known best as a fiery Pennsylvania congressman during the mid-19th century, the movie reveals the political skill, intellectual depth, and fearless determination of this remarkable individual whose contribution to the legislative history of America has shaped the very soul of this country. Hi, I'm Charlie Greenwald, your host for this look at one of the most significant molders and shapers of U.S. history, at least when it comes to guaranteeing all people equal rights and equal protection under the law. Nicknamed the old commoner, Stevens would not have won any contests for personality or charm. The descriptions of his life and the adjectives used about him are not pretty. Crusty, nasty, cynical, evil genius. In a day when most subjects of photographs were serious looking, Stevens comes across as even more grim and forbidding than most. His words were direct, caustic, unyielding, but extremely convincing. You will not find a Thaddeus Stevens speech that is ambivalent, non-committal, or opaque. He was dogmatic unyielding, very acerbic. If you were with him, you were in good. Heaven help you if, if, if you were against him. Given the impact he had on Pennsylvania, it's easy to assume Stevens was born here. But actually, he grew up in Vermont. And if adverse childhood circumstances shape one's life and character, then Stevens is Exhibit A. He had a club foot, and back when he was born in 1795, that wasn't seen as something that um, society supported. It was actually seen as a, uh, a sign of some secret sin in the family. So he was um, not only suffering from that disadvantage in a society that was agrarian, that was very physical and required physical labor, which was a problem for him, but also one which uh, he was teased and discriminated against uh, by children and adults as well. So his childhood was uh, extremely uh, traumatic. In addition, his father was an alcoholic who abandoned the family, leaving them nearly penniless. The poverty and discrimination he experienced forged his commitment to providing opportunity to the downtrodden and excluded. It would be a long time before the term American Dream came into vogue. That was the essence of what Stevens was looking to provide, regardless of one's race, religion, or social status. He put those beliefs into practice during his early professional life as a teacher in a one-room school in York, Pennsylvania, then embarking on a successful law career in nearby Gettysburg, whose voters elected him to the Pennsylvania General Assembly. His first agenda item was to establish some sort of public school system for elementary students in Pennsylvania. He worked closely with Governor Wolf and a few other legislators to uh, um, write the Free Schools Act, which was passed in April of 1834. He expected the folks of Pennsylvania to be very excited about this law, but they were not. Uh, they, they were furious. Many taxpayers said, we are not going to pay this tax for children to go to school, children who are not our own. So the Senate was ready, willing, and able to um, repeal the, the free schools law. A few weeks later, it was time for the representatives to, settle, to consider the issue. And uh, Thad Stevens delivered a speech in the state capitol. Even though it was two hours long, it, the audience held on to every word. Uh, it was 
uh, very forceful, direct, to the point. It was unforgettable. It was eloquent. And he said such things as, if the citizens of Pennsylvania are willing to pay for um, jails and courts, why are they not willing to pay for schools, for education of their children? The folks in the gallery and their representatives who were his fellow voters uh, were, began nodding their heads. And surely enough, when he was finished speaking, the chamber exploded in wild applause. Stephen's speech opposing repeal was so powerful that the measure was transformed into one strengthening the system. But he also hoped for a system where education was available to children of every race, reflecting his lifelong obsession with breaking down walls of race and class distinction. We certainly have a rich diversity of, of students here in Lancaster City, and this is certainly what Thad must have had in mind when he campaigned for, um, for free, common, public elementary schools. Looking for a fresh political and economic start, he moved here to Lancaster in 1842 and soon was elected to the United States Congress, where his fierce abolitionist efforts helped chart the course of American history. Of all the different statesmen, politicians in U.S. history, he epitomizes the core value of this country, that are all persons are created equal. And he wasn't just mouthing that like Jefferson did. To Jefferson, it was just an intellectual exercise. He said, well, yeah, all people are created equal, but we're going to tolerate slavery for however long it exists. He believed it to his core and worked relentlessly uh, to achieve that ideal. He had a 47-year quest or crusade to free African Americans to abolish slavery in the United States, 47 years. The movie Lincoln chronicles how he pushed President Lincoln to legislate slavery out of American society, wanting to move much faster than the legislative process was able to move. But his efforts finally culminated in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, abolishing slavery. One of the major sub-themes of that movie is the extent to which the strong-willed Thaddeus Stevens learned that he had to compromise in order to get lasting results. He learned that he couldn't carry the ball all himself. He needed friends. He needed a majority. He needed a two-thirds majority in Congress. He learned from the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention of 1837, 1838, that laws can be swept aside and can be reversed by the United States Supreme Court. What you need is an amendment to the United States Constitution. He learned that in the 1830s, 1840s. Stevens was in his own league when it came to dismantling political foes. His brutal assessment of James Buchanan predated the low rating the only Pennsylvanian to hold the presidency would earn. There is no such person running as James Buchanan, Stevens said. He is dead of lockjaw. Nothing remains but a platform and a bloated mass of political putatry. Another sub-theme of the recent movie Lincoln is the way Thaddeus Stevens was able to manipulate the legislative system. He was uh, an incredible parliamentarian. He knew uh, parliamentary tricks. Uh, he has been said to be the greatest parliamentarian in U.S. history. The man who, more than a century later, succeeded him in the U.S. Congress, found inspiration from Stevens' life. I, I think what he did was take the values of Lancaster County, and he represented them in the nation in a way that made a national impact. Uh, and those national impacts, I think, have been um, extremely important to, to us as a country. He was the uh, strongest parliamentarian, the greatest parliamentarian the country has ever seen. And he did it all without becoming Speaker of the House or even uh, Majority Leader uh, of the House. He did it out of his position as a committee chairman. Uh, and um, uh, he was uh, very, very strong and was able to manipulate the Congress uh, in uh, ways that no one before him or since him uh, has been able to do. One of the plaques in this memorial exhibit in Lancaster references a parliamentary move by Thaddeus Stevens that some refer to as the day he saved the country. After Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson became president. This, uh, selecting Andrew Johnson was probably the worst thing that the Republican parties did because Andrew Johnson was a Southern Democrat. And being a Southern Democrat, he started wholesale pardons of uh, the Confederate officials and he allowed them to hold congressional elections down in the South. And they elected Confederate officials 
to the Congress. The Southern congressmen could have gone up to uh, the House, joined up with their uh, Northern Democratic allies, and they could have taken over the House and the Senate. And they could have continued slavery. A lot of people don't realize that there was a loophole in the 13th Amendment. It said that uh, uh, involuntary servitude was prohibited except for convicts. Of course, you have to have involuntary servitude for convicts. You can't let them go free. So the South said, fine, we'll make all blacks convicts. And the way they did that was they said, if you're a slave that steps off of your uh, plantation thinking you're free, a sheriff can come up to you and say, do you have a job? No, you're a vagrant. You have to pay $250. If they couldn't pay the $250, then they were put back on the plantation as convict labor. So essentially, the, the uh, country would have lost uh, what they had gained in the Civil War if this had been allowed to happen. But Thaddeus Stevens, who was the master of the House at that time, uh, even though he was not the Speaker of the House, he came up with a plan uh, to prevent this. And he came up with, with, it, with Edward McPherson, who was his protege and also the uh, clerk of the House. So, like every other session, uh, Edward McPherson starts calling the roll of the new Congress, and he gets to the Southern names, and he skips them. The Southerners jump up and down and say, you can't do that, you can't do that. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens gets up and says, point of order, we can discuss no business until we finish calling the roll. The roll is finished, the Southerners are out, and then they start working towards Reconstruction. Stevens was hated by many in the South because of his uncompromising position that the South should pay dearly for the harm it caused the nation. He wanted to see the Southern states punished for what they had done for their insurrection. The Civil War remains one of the most significant and controversial events in American history. Museums like this one in Harrisburg document the impact on American life. Yet the difficult times that the war brought upon the nation didn't end with the signing of surrender terms at Appomattox. After the war, the country was faced with the whole new question of how to restructure American society. And Thaddeus Stevens, no surprise there, was right in the middle of it. He found himself in a pitched political war with the new president, Andrew Johnson, a Tennessean who Stevens felt was much too accommodating of the interests of Southern whites. A series of Johnson vetoes striking down laws designed to protect the rights of newly freed slaves compelled Stevens to propose what would become the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. His draft ended up being watered down, but he voted for it nonetheless, explaining that, I live among men, not among angels. The 14th Amendment is the greatest legacy that Thaddeus Stevens has left us for the first time, it requires that all people are treated equally. Even though our republic was uh, founded on the idea that all men are created equal, as Thomas Jefferson said, that was not law until the 14th Amendment was passed. The 14th Amendment also requires that there are certain privileges that uh, Americans have which cannot be abridged by the states. Uh, that means that civil liberties are, uh, are stretched to the state level. A lot of people don't realize that the Bill of Rights, freedom of press, freedom of religion, did not exist on the state level until the 14th Amendment. It's essentially changed the nature of the Constitution uh, you know, from then on. The battle between President and Congress continued, escalating to the point where Stevens led a move to impeach Johnson. The House of Representatives voted for the Articles of Impeachment. Stevens was part of the prosecution team in the trial conducted by the Senate, but was too ill to actively participate. He attempted to deliver a summation of the case, but someone had to finish reading it. Stevens was appalled when Johnson was acquitted by a single vote. Another of Stevens' crusades was to allow free slaves and African Americans from the North to be able to fight for the Union Army during the Civil War. He was an early and uh, vocal advocate for uh, using uh, uh, black troops. In fact, uh, in early 1862, he said there was basically two things that had to be done to uh, win the war, and that was one, to free the slaves, and two, to put them in the army. 
Stevens cajoled the Congress into passing the Second Confiscation Act in July 1862, which authorized the President not only to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, but also to enroll the free slaves in the military. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but had to be browbeaten by Stevens into setting up what were called the Colored Troops. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lincoln administration uh, paid the uh, new uh, black uh, soldiers half pay of white soldiers and Thaddeus Stevens again had to come to the rescue in uh, late 1864 and equalize the pay. So despite the unpopularity of the idea, even in the North, Thaddeus Stevens was able to convince Congress to set up and pay black soldiers to fight against the South. It is what won the war for the Union because by the end of the Union, by the end of the war we had 200,000 uh, black soldiers in the army and Lincoln acknowledged that that's what gave the winning edge to the Union. Stevens' view of women was decades ahead of his time. He wanted to include in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution a provision giving women the right to vote, something that Congress thought was too radical. Instead, Congress, over the objection of Thaddeus Stevens, specified that only males could vote. In fact, he made a um, a joke about it saying how uh, all the bachelor uh, congressmen agreed with him and it was only the married ones that wanted to put male into the Constitution. Stevens' attitude of acceptance of women was also reflected by his relationship with a widow named Lydia Hamilton Smith, a woman of color who started out as his housekeeper but soon became his confidant, co-equal, and hostess. Darlene Cologne performs a portrayal of Lydia in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. I initially started as his housekeeper, but he saw in me the desire to learn. And with his understanding that everybody had the, should have the ability to learn and become independent, he taught me the ways of finance. And as I became very adept at that finance, he had enough confidence in me that he turned over his own finances to me. So I became not only housekeeper and household manager, but also his financial manager as well. I did well enough, in fact, that I purchased six properties here in Lancaster on my own. Stevens' detractors accused him of using Lydia Hamilton Smith as his mistress, something that even the movie Lincoln implied at one point, despite what Stevens' biographers insist is the complete lack of factual support. Those were the rumors for years in Washington spread around by his enemies. There's zero evidence that that ever happened. That would be their only way of explaining why he would treat me as an equal. They had to make me lesser than what I was. He felt I should have the opportunity to be independent and be able to make my own living. And it should not be you should not be stopped based just on whether or not you're a woman or a man or whether you are black or white or whatever your race or culture may be. Apart from politics, he experienced professional and business success. Roughly the middle third of his life was spent in Gettysburg. As an attorney, he showed the skills that would later be evident in Congress. He was outstanding in trial, being involved in more than 3,000 cases over the years, appearing frequently before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and generally winning the cases. The properties he acquired numbered in the hundreds, the acres he owned numbered in the thousands. The time of his death, he had at one time or another owned 34 houses, 29 outbuildings, 17 barns, two orchards, two furnaces, three forges, a rolling mill, and a huge amount of land. He was a collector of property. Among them, the charcoal iron furnace at Caledonia, which was established in 1837. At its peak, the self-contained village there was home to 200 workers and families. During the Civil War, Confederate leaders who bristled over his strong condemnations of slavery made a special point when their army invaded Pennsylvania to make certain that their troops burned Stevens' Caledonia works. When Stevens heard of this, he asked whether they also burned his debts for the property. At his death, Stevens was holding notes worth more than $100,000, money he lent individuals who lacked the capacity or the intent to repay. Stevens used his property 
in order to, I think, provide status and, and hopefully financial security for himself, although that never really came about because of other decisions that he made. He also acquired it to provide employment for people. I am, I am sure that he kept Caledonia Furnace open to provide employment for the whites and the blacks that were in that area who were working for him. And I am certain that he kept his properties in order to run fugitive slaves on the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, of course, was an illegal activity. As a result, there are next to no actual records of what took place. And Thaddeus Stevens was always kind of around the edges of the Underground Railroad. But if you look at it here in Adams County, his fingerprints were all over it. A recent discovery at this building in Lancaster supports that theory. Purchased by Stevens at a sheriff's sale in 1842, it became his home and law office for the last 25 years of his life. But it was recently included in the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program because of a discovery that happened as preservationists were renovating the house to include it as a historical site. They found a cistern, a water vessel that was used for collecting, collecting and using domestic water supplies at that time. Um, they opened the cistern and found artifacts from the time period, but most importantly, they found a, a very rough opening in one end of the cistern that connected to the, um, the foundation wall of what had been the tavern next door to here, which was also owned by Thaddeus Stevens. When the slave catchers were in the area, it, is, it seems to be logical to assume that the people in this complex of buildings needed a, a very secure place to hide. The theory that the archaeologists have come up with, this vessel, this cistern, was used to harbor freedom seekers when slave catchers were in the area, you can almost reach no other conclusion that this underground vessel was indeed an, under, an emergency hiding place for formerly enslaved people moving through Lancaster City and County on the Underground Railroad. The events in the wake of Stevens' passing reveal much about the man and his place and time. This was his choice for a burial plot, a small, out-of-the-way cemetery in the city of Lancaster, but the only one open at that time people of all races. There were no other cemeteries in this town at that time that would allow black and white to be buried together. I repose in this quiet and secluded spot, not from any natural preference for solitude, but finding other cemeteries limited to race by charter rules. I have chosen this that I might illustrate in my death the principles which I advocated through a long life, equality of man before his creator. His will designated $50,000 to establish a school for the relief and refuge of homeless, indigent orphans. He wrote, no preference shall be shown on account of race or color in their admission or treatment. They shall be fed at the same table. At the time, $50,000 wasn't enough to establish such a school, but in 1905, 37 years after his death, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania kicked in the additional funds to create the Thaddeus Stevens Industrial School in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which, while training men and women in all kinds of technological skills, seeks to embody the values of Thaddeus Stevens. We try and guard that legacy. We try to be um, uh, keepers of the concepts that he had in mind. So today, uh, we've grown from just 25 or 30 students. We have about 900 students. Half of those students uh, come here at essentially no cost, depending on how much financial need they have. We have a very diverse student body, and uh, that is by uh, design. And we teach our students about Thaddeus Stevens and uh, his contributions, what he believed in, and his intent for the school. As powerful as Stevens' pursuit of abolition and civil rights for freed slaves was, this did not constitute his universe in the fight for tolerance, equality, and opportunity. He supported all those targeted by discrimination. Indians, Chinese, Mormons, Jews, Muslim, and women. Anytime he saw suffering, if he saw children that were poor or that didn't have shoes or didn't have things, he took from his own money and got them medical care, bought them shoes, he bought uh, farms for widows who were losing their homes. He did these types of things and um, in keeping with that was his philosophy, that's why he became such a strong abolitionist. He couldn't stand to see the injustice and the discrimination.
Stevens acknowledged his own imperfection, and the record reflects an occasional brush with scandal and misjudgment. Yet when measured against his contemporaries, these missteps were relatively few and insignificant. Upon his death, Thaddeus Stevens' coffin lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Only the third American afforded that honor at the time, including Abraham Lincoln. He was attended by a black Union honor guard. 20,000 people attended his funeral in Lancaster, half of them free black men. The reputation of Thaddeus Stevens has certainly evolved over the years. Genuinely hated south of the Mason-Dixon line for his desire to punish the South for the Civil War and insisting on an end to their practice of human slavery, Stevens was vilified in the 1915 racist film Birth of a Nation, which sought to portray life in the United States after the Civil War. Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith were depicted as the, the evil connivers who were trying to bring vengeance on the South. Uh, and, and they were the central antagonist of this film. Virtually every stereotype, negative stereotype about black people was de were depicted in that film. And I believe they were, they were that conscious, they were emblazoned on the consciousness of the American pop population, uh, that black people are indolent and no good and we should segregate and all of those negative stereotypes. So at the same time, you have a negative stereotype of blacks. You have uh, these really humanitarian characters, Stevens and Smith, depicted in this most negative way. In our public memories, the reputation of Thaddeus Stevens is more established by his enemies than by his friends. But now, as we move through the 21st century, with the benefit of seeing the impact of this man, what he stood for, and what he accomplished, we recognize that few men and women have their actions so closely match their words and their principles. The movie Lincoln, uh, uh, for the first time, portrayed Thaddeus Stevens as the uh, kind of uh, uh, visionary politician that he really was. Stevens and the men who legislated with him in the 1860s brought about the greatest American legislative revolution in our nation after the Bill of Rights. Among the papers discovered when Thaddeus Stevens died were notes that he had prepared for the arguments on behalf of the 14th Amendment. I have done what I deem best for humanity, he wrote. he wrote. It is easy to protect the interests of the rich and the powerful, but it is a great labor to protect the interests of the poor and the downtrodden. Few have labored so diligently to such great ends as Thaddeus Stevens. Few who have made Pennsylvania home have had such a dramatic impact on the destiny of our commonwealth and our nation. It is well for us to remember him. This is Charlie Greenwald. Thanks for watching and for rediscovering Thaddeus Stevens. Thank you.